Let me summarize very briefly last week uh, the ideas that were presented in next, ne last week's year. What's important to remember, or rather, what have we covered until now? In order to, that it shouldn't get confusing. What have we covered until now? First, what we went through the idea of Odom Vekayan and uh, demonstrated the idea of the concept of Mashiach in Odom, and that's how it really began, and then also Kayan. Then again, after that, we went into the idea of Yosef and Yehuda, and again, how you see the continuation of the theme of Mashiach. Then after that, we went into the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu and Mitzrayim, the, the Jews of Mitzrayim. Again, you see the continuation of the idea of the fundamental uh, tasks, the Mashiach. Then I, I, uh, I began speaking about what is the structure of the Mashiach in Nuchnistic terms. And I had gone to explain on that. And that, of course, enables, it sheds light on a lot of different events once you understand the the uh, structure spiritually of what's happening with the Mashiach. One can understand a lot of different ideas in Tanakh. And then last week what I had gone into is the interpretation of history, the phenomena of history, the events of history, as nothing more than that which is based on two different ideas. This is what I had gone into last week. In other words, I had gone into the idea and this is, I just want to offer as a short summary in terms of last week's year, that there are basically two determining principles that determine the course of events. It determines human history. The first idea is that every event expresses the gilui or the hester, the amount of gilui yehudo the rebunish and the bria, or its opposite, the amount of concealment or hester yehudo of the Rebunishim and the Bria. And that, of course, depends on the mitzvahs and the chatoim of the Jews. So therefore, history always reflects that changing status, that status of how much Gil and Hester is there as a result of the mitzvahs and the, or mitzvahs or the chatoim of Jews. The second fundamental principle is that all events, at the same time that they are expressing the status or the state of Hester and Gilui is also stating another idea. And that is the idea of the two tikkunim, which I had mentioned. The two ideas, the two tasks. And of the fact that, you know, it's all, history expresses the, these two ideas and how they are to be fulfilled by the Jews. Since the Jews are the nation selected, which I'll go into today more, much more in depth, to be involved with being masakin, the chet of Odom Rishon, which is a kilkel, and the original chasan of Odom Rishon, which, what, which is what he was born into, the Jews were, create, were, uh, were the people chosen to actually correct those two situations. Therefore, History is always involved in giving them, at any historical point, the ability to massacre those two in Yonam, as well as their own contributions to Chet, which Jews keep always, unfortunately, adding to. Jews, unfortunately, do Chet, so therefore history gets worse and worse in terms of more Hester, which means more evil and so on. So therefore Jews not only have to massacre the in Yonam of Adam, but also the contributions that they keep making as a result of the Chatoim. So therefore we see that history is determined by two fundamental ideas and I cannot, under, I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of what I'm saying now. That all history we can understood in terms of how it reflects the amount of Hester and Gilu in the universe because of the mitzvahs of Jews or Chatoim of Jews. And again that history must, every historical event has the proper situation or opportunity for the Jews to be massacre the different inyonim, the two inyonim that have originated from Odom Rishon, as well as also being massacre their contributions to Hester, which is their own chatoy. Every Hester means concealment. Have to, yeah. Now, 
So therefore, those are the two fundamental ideas that all history reflects the Gideon Hester, A, and B, that every stage of history must have a situation where the Jews can massacre the different inyonim of Adam and their own contributions to the Chet. And therefore, history allows them to have those tikkunim. Okay? Those are the two fundamental ideas in history. Like I said before, I can't overemphasize the importance of those two principles. Now, in order to massacre the inyonim, okay, I had mentioned that the first of the inyonim is to be mispashi kedusha, to spread holiness throughout. Okay? And I'll explain that in more detail. The second was to subjugate the Yitzhahara, the Sitra Akhra, under Kedusha. It means to subjugate him, make him a tool for Kedusha. Don't allow him to win. Okay? Now, this idea, the second idea, which is called Kfiyas Hora, Kfiyas HaSitra Akhra, the subjugation, okay, the domination, the subjugation of the Sitra Akhra, its basic uh, purpose is realized in basically one of three ways. How does the Jews subjugate the Sitra Akhra? How does that happen? In other words, how is that second Tikkun of Odom Rishon done? It's done basically in one of three ways. The first way is that when the Jews are in, within these Klippas, within the Goyim, and these Goyim are generally the representative of the Sitra Akhra because they, they do exactly what the Sitra Akhra wants them to do because that's what they freely choose. So therefore, they are a tool in his hands. So therefore, when Jews are in living among the Goyim, and this is exactly what's been happening for the last 2,000 years, that's why the second Tikkun is almost outweighed the first Tikkun of, the tikkun of Hispashi Sakadusha, that will take place really in Yemesha Mashiach. But right now, for the last 2,000 years, we've been trying to correct the power given to the Sitra Akhra as a result of Odom Rishon's Chet, as well as the, all the Chatoim of the Eden. So therefore, that is generally done, this Kfiyas Ra is generally done in one of three ways. That a Jew should, has to try to remain at Tzaddik under the Goyim, remain, maintain his Sitkis. Therefore, Habakkuk said, Tzaddik be'emunoso yichyeh, that a righteous man would live by his emuno, that even if the evil gets so great, has such great domination, where you don't even see any Kedush anymore, you have to remain from in your emuno. The second way of... of the second idea of how Kfiyas Ra works is that the Jews suffer at the hands of a guy. That's the second way. So therefore, what a Jew does when he suffers at the hands of a guy is that the, all the power given to the Sitra Akhra, and therefore which gives the power of the guy to subjugate the Jews, Jews, is dissipated. Because once you give him the power, that's it. So what else does he want? I mean, you've given him what his due is. He's done it. He's... He's put Yisur into Yidin, which is, of course, the Oynish, of he, that's Hesti Yechudah, as I had mentioned previously. So then what else does he want? So therefore you dissipate his strength by suffering at his hands. So therefore the second way of being Kfiyas Ra, subjugating evil, is to suffer at the hands of evil until you've dissipated all his power. So that's the second way. And the third way, of course, of the dissipation is the fact that evil itself proliferates more and more. So again, it dissipates its power because that's what he gets as a result of Chatoim, of Adam and, and of the Jews. So therefore, the fact that there's such a tigbirus hurrah, a proliferation of evil throughout the Bria, again dissipates his power. Now, just to make a timely a comment about the Yisurin, once we understand that Jews suffering Yisurin is part of the second tikkun of Kfiyas Ra, and we, this has been going on for the last 2,000 years, we can understand now that the Rabbani Shalom want, wants, apparently, to speed up the Geula, to speed up the Messianic process. So what he's done is he's taken the Jews and he's given the Yisurim, which are incredible, and that, of course, is the Holocaust. That the Holocaust is the second Tikkun in an incredibly short amount of time. And unfortunately, it, it of course, is the... Uh, the aftermath is, is of course, is, uh, horrendous in that way. But the, the second Tikkun of Kfir Sarah, that's the way you take away the power of the Sitra Akhra by suffering at his hands. Unfortunately, of course, that, that is really what the Holocaust has been. So the Bershom took the Asurin, which is really the, the way the Jews are being mechapa, 
or rather the way the beam is stuck in that Kfiyasara is through Yisur and he took the Yisur that perhaps should have been spread over 100 years or 200 years and he put it in 6 short years or whatever and therefore the tremendous Yisur that the Jews have gone through as a result of the Holocaust has been an incredible tikkun for the whole idea of Kfiyas Ra that's the toiv that has come out of it unfortunately the Jews of course are massacring it through their own Yisur and the reason why they are, if you recall, that the, the Rebbe Hashem has given three ways for a man to get Olam Habo, which means that he's given three ways to be Megala Yehudai. One is Mitzvah, second is Tshuva, and the third is Yisurin. If a person does Mitzvah, great. If he doesn't do Mitzvah, the Rebbe Hashem has given another way, Tshuva. If he does Tshuva, he can still get Olam Habo because that's still Gil Yehudai. What happens if he doesn't either? Then the Rebbe Hashem gives him Yisurin. And that's a third way of getting Olam Habo, and I discussed a long time ago how Yisurin is Megali Yehudai. But in any case, Yisurin is the last method and the least desirable method in terms of what the Rebbe Hashanah wants. However, it is a method that works, Yisurin. So therefore, in the second Tikkun of Kfiyas Ra, either you remain at Tzaddik, which is what? The first two, Mitzvah Satshuva. And if you don't remain at Tzaddik, then the second way is, or the third way is, Yisurin. So in other words, Kfiyas Ra itself has three ways. Either do mitzvahs and tshuva in among the, within the goyim, which means that you maintain your tzitkus through tshuva or through mitzvahs and tshuva. That's a desirable way of taking away the power of the sitra akra. And if you don't do that, then you have to use a third mechanism in the second tikkun. The third mechanism is yisurin in the second tikkun, which is kfiyas ra. So therefore, unfortunately, that's what the basic method the Jews have been doing for the last 2,000 years is going from one country to the other in terms of expulsions and pogroms and so on. They have also been doing the second, the, the, uh, the other method of tzaddik, the mitzvahs and tshuva, because Klai Yisrael has been doing a tremendous amount of tzitkus also, even though they've gone through all the goyim, they have never forsaken the Torah and so on. However, unfortunately, the Yisrael has also been a method which has been always with the Jews, and Yisurin is the tikkun of the is the Yisurin is the third method which the Jews use as a tikkun of the uh, as uh, in order to masakin the second tikkun which is subjugate the evil. Therefore, and the Holocaust, just as an example, is one of the in, very significant ways of how the Yisurin of the Eden has been masakin the uh, the uh, Indian of Kfiyasara, which is a second task of man. Now. This is basically the idea of history once we understand the process of Mashiach. In other words, what we realize now is a very interesting idea. And again, I cannot overemphasize. History is nothing more than the ongoing attempt at man to massacre the ideas or the two, two ideas in other mission plus his own contributions to the Kilkel. That's all it is. That's all the rebellion wants. The entire history is nothing more than to give man, originally it was Adam, and now it's Yidin. They are the ones who have the Tikkunim, not everybody else, which I'll go into later. So therefore history is nothing more than the attempt to furnish man the framework by which he can massacre everything in the Bria. The Chassan of Adam and the Kilkel of Adam, plus the Kilkel of the Jews' own contribution. And all history is that kind of an image. And if you look at Jewish history that way, you mamish can figure out and see the turn of events as, t- as in t- the entire uh, era of course, the entire ongoings of Jewish history. So therefore we see that the Meshichin, Meshich ben Yosef, which is what? Or Meshich ben David, which is involved in the idea of Hispashtus Kedusha, to spread holiness throughout. And the Meshich ben Yosef, who is involved in the Kfiyas Ra, that these two individuals really present two different ideas, two different tikkunim, which goes throughout the Bria. That's the idea. That is the fundamental ideas in the Bria, what the Rebbe wants. Those are the fundamental tasks of the Jews. And it's done through mitzvahs, tshuva, and yisurin. And the task is either to be mespashe kedusha or to be kufa the ra tachas kedusha. This is the entire idea in a very succinct summary you know so I hope it's understood or appreciated the significance of, of this entire summary in terms of what it really means it's, it's the clue 
the key to understanding the entire 6,000 years of man's history. In other words, this is the internal design of history. That's really what it is. So it would be very profitable, of course, for everybody to go into history and now look at it this way. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I've gone through Odom and Cain. I've gone through Yosef and Yehuda. I've gone through Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jews in Mitzrayim. And we see, lo and behold, these two tikkunim keep going. Okay? Right now what I'm going to do is begin the next topic. Again, the Ishtalshlus, the evolution or the continuity of this idea throughout history. And I'm going to backtrack a little and go into the entire idea of the Ovas. The Ovas. Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov. And especially I'm going to dwell on Yaakov and Esau. What is Yaakov and Esau all, really all about? And most people have no understanding. It's mm. learned in a very superficial way. Well, in general, Torah is learned in a very superficial way. But the idea of the internal design of what's really going on in terms of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Yaakov and Esau, and the 12 Shvatim, this is what I want to go into next. Uh, this is what I'm going to devote this year and, and until I finish the, these ideas. And then after, I'm going to, go to skip and go into the next stage of history, which is courses Rechavim and Yerovim, Shlima Melech. And then I'm just going to continue down until we get to Rabbi Akiva, and then into the next 2,000 years. So in effect, what I'm doing for you is actually demonstrating to you how these ideas go through the entire 6,000 years of history. And I'm merely giving to you in a very general way. Of course, hopefully, people will themselves will go back into the Chumash having this internal design, having these keys, and you'll be able to see the incredible beauty of Chumash, Torah, as Mamish the Psukum show you, which I will be demonstrating as we go on. Now, let's go back now into the Ovas. Because that's really where we're up to. We're now into the idea of the Ovas. And the question, of course, is what is this all about? Why are there no Jews, or rather, why are there no Goyim? There are only Jews. What is the significance of the Jews? And what, what does it mean by to be a Jew? And what does it mean to be a Goy? What is really all these ideas really all about? And how do we understand it in terms of the actual... Uh, uh, course of events as we see in, in Torah itself and how do you see it mamish in the psukim where you can look at the posik on one level and it's one story which is usually of course the way people learn and then you look at another level and it's a completely different story which means that you will learn in Chumash apisuid in terms of the secret ideas of what's going on in the Chumash now in order to understand the obvious we have to backtrack again to Adam because in order, in order to get that overview, we have to backtrack to Adam. Now, <clears throat> it's very important to understand that uh, th- uh, these, this idea. There's a medrash that says that, and I had repeated this previously, but now I'm really going to go into the depths of it and so on. The medrash says that the Russian made a tenai, a condition with the Bria. What was that? He said, if Israel accepts the Torah, mutov, good. If Israel does not accept the Torah, then I'm going to restore the Bria to Toyu Vavoyu. I'm going to bring it back into the chaos that it should have been. Why? Because what is the Rebbe Shemir really saying? If there, are in, if there is an individual or individuals, that's what Israel means. It doesn't mean Jews. It means any individual who will make an agreement with me to do my will and if I will give Moil Mabo, good. Then I'll do that. If not, then the whole universe is not justified. It's not justified in terms of creating it. So therefore, Yisrael means any individual. Yisrael means Yoshar Kael, righteous of God. Which means an individual who is righteous, who does what the Rebbe Shalom wants. Mitzvahs, whatever the Rebbe Shalom wants. Ratzon Hashem, that's Yoshar Kael. Therefore, <clears throat> if there's an individual, individuals who are Yoshar Kael, means that that's they'll do the will of God, then it was worth creating the universe. That's the whole point of it. That a person should work, labor, and then get the ulama ball in order to avoid Nam Sufak. If it doesn't work, then there's no point in the Bria. So then, Mach of the whole world. This is the, what the Medrash says. What do we see? We see the, that the, the, the concept Yisrael does not mean Jews. It means any, an individual or individuals who are righteous. Okay? That's a very important idea to understand. Now, <clears throat> <clears throat> this idea Yisrael really devolved on Adam. He was the first man. So he was the first Jew 
in quotations. It wasn't a Jew because there was no such thing as a nation different from other nations. All men were supposed to have this. The universal man was Adam. <clears throat> and his task, of course, was to be Yosha Kael, to listen to the tzivoy of the Rebbein Shlom. As a result of the fact that he didn't, what happened? So the, therefore, what was, so therefore, Yisrael devolved upon who? Adam, right? And what was the task of Adam? One tikkun. What was the tikkun? To masakin the chasern, which means the original hester that God put into the world. That was the, the job of Adam. And, he, and, and it, of course, manifests itself in terms of a tree and the Yitzhar and the Nachish and so on, which, of course, is really this whole Bechina, which I explained before in the, in the ideas of Adam Rishon and the, the structure of man psychologically. But in any case, this was Adam's task. It, and, this, and this task is called Tikkun of Kedusha, the correction of the amount of holiness besuid in terms of the idea of his pashed the whole madrig of Seho. That Odom Rishon was supposed to reveal this Kedusha, which means to reveal the presence of God, Gili Yechudoi, right? Throughout all its levels, throughout all the, the universe, in every facet of the universe, he had to reveal this Kedusha. That's Tikkun Kedusha besuid his pashed this madrig of Seho. To reveal or to massacre the fact that there's a chasar in the Bria, that Kedusha is not here, right? There is no Gili Yehudai, there's a chasar. He had to massacre that and spread Kedusha, which means Gili Yehudai, throughout the entire Bria. That is what Yisrael should have done. Then he would have been Yosher Kel. Okay? <clears throat> Instead, what they do, and therefore Yisrael also means, besides the fact that Yisrael means Yosher Kel, Yisrael also means, it comes from what Srora, rulership, rule. What he would have done is he would have ruled over the Sitra Achra, who wanted him not to do that task, and therefore he would he'd be called Yisrael, Yisrael, the one who rules concerning the Rabbani Shlom. He rules concerning the mitzvahs of the Rabbani Shlom. And that's really what the Malach called Yaakov. Sariso imelukim bimanoshim. You contended. You ruled over the, not over the Rebbein Shalom, but you ruled over man in terms of the ideas or the rotten of the Rebbein Shalom. So that's the two meanings of Israel. But in any case, Israel means was devolved upon Adam, and his task was, the task of Israel was Tikkun Kedusha in all its madrigas to remove the Hester to remove the concealment, which is the original chasan of the Bria, and instead to be Megali Yehudi throughout the world. This was the task of Adam Horishan. <clears throat> However, since Adam failed, so therefore a new task arose. What was that? That is the, so therefore what happened? Evil became internalized in man. So the idea is to kick evil out, to get it out of the Bria. And you do that by subjugating evil. <clears throat> You subjugate the evil under Kedusha, which means that evil serves Kedusha. And how do you do that? As I mentioned previously and last week, that you become a tzaddik, you maintain your tzitkis in the Sitra Akhra, and you use the uniqueness, you recall, of each nation to serve God. The same way the Sitra Akhra wants to hide the Rebbe Islam, which is in 70 different ways are represented by 70 different umas, you use that uniqueness to Adrab, to Megala, Yehudai. And therefore, what that makes, it makes the Sitra Akhra impotent. He's powerless. You dissipate his energy. In any case, so the second task of man as a result of the Chet of Adam is called Kfiya Sitra Akhra, the whole Madre Guseha, to subjugate the Sitra Akhra, the evil, in all its levels, Tachas Kedusha, under Kedusha. Okay, in other words, to take the zoyama of the, the snake, the poison of the snake, which he put into the Bria, right? The tumor which he put into the Bria, which means the hester of the Rebbe in the Bria, that's how it manifests itself, to take that and to remove it, to remove that hester, that zoyama, or the kilkel, because it's damage, because that's man's contribution to the amount of hester. That's man's damage. So therefore, Kfiya Sitra Akhra means to remove the Zoyama, the Tumor, the Kilkel, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, or the Hester, and to restore the Giloi, the way it was before Adam Rishon's Chet, and then to do the first task, to be Mespashet Kedusha, throughout all the levels. 
Those are the two fundamental ideas in the entire Bria. Okay? And again we see how it started with Adam. So therefore what comes out now is that Yisrael now has two jobs. Who's Yisrael? First it was Adam with one job. Now Yisrael became all mankind with two jobs. First job was Fias the Sitra Akhra, to subjugate the Sitra Akhra, to remain at Sadiq in the Sitra Akhra, right? And of course, if that doesn't work, then you have Yisurin and you have the other backup systems that enable you to be clear for the Sitra Akhra. So since, since man failed, Yisrael, right? Yes, Yosh Kale, now has two jobs to do both the Ispashtis HaKedusha and the Kfir Sarah. But who is Yisrael? Yisrael is still all mankind. Therefore, there's still no Jews. Even after Adam is gone, you still have Cain and Hevel, and you have all the, all the, uh, all the people, Noach, everybody. Until we get to, of course, until we get to Avram. Now, the, these two ideas, which were taken on by all mankind, is now personified in two Shrushim, Bi'ika. One is called the Shirish of the Mashiach ben David, and the other is called the Shirish of the Mashiach ben Yosef, which means that the two most significant parts of the Nisham of Adam Horishan was now divided in the sense that one had to remove the evil of the Kilkel, which is Ben Yosef, and one had to restore the Kedusha in the Bria, which was Ben David. That's the ideas of the two Mashiachan. They are two fundamental sources. That's the tree. The tree itself, in order to keep the work going, can mispash it or go out into many shrashim. Remember the Ruchni uh, the, the spiritual structure of the Mashiach? They can, of course, they divide the many shrashim. The tree itself, which is the fundamental stock, the tree, which does these two avoidus, and that's Masak and the Neshama of Odom region. And they themselves give rise to many shrashim, as I mentioned previously. Either you ben Yosef or you ben David, you're into the two different kinds of tikkunim, which affect the Nisham of Odom region, from which both emanate, and therefore there's a tikkun to the Bria. Now, besides the Asoid of either side, ben Yosef ben David, besides the Shrashim of either side, ben Yosef or ben David, and of course only those, either the Asoid or the Shrashim, can be Mashiach itself, because he's the one who finally wraps up the job. Besides this, Klai Yisrael is also in one of the other tikkunim. Every Jew is either in the category of Ben Yosef or in the category of Ben David. That's where every Jew fits. Except he comes from other parts of the Neshama of Odom Rishon. But the whole source of the whole job to correct this is from the Shrashim, which uh, from the Yisoidis, the tree, which are the Shrashim, which are the branches. And then you have all the other branches, all the other things coming out of the tree, all the leaves and so on. That's the rest of Klai Yisrael. So therefore, the truth is that all Jews are involved in that Avodah. The Avodah of <clears throat> either Kfias, the Sitra Akhra, under the Kedusha, which stems from the aspect of the Neshama, the Yusoyed and the Shirish of Ben Yosef. So they revolve out of that. Or they are involved in the Tikkun of Ben David, which is that Yusoyed, no Shrashim. And they are involved in the Mispash Kedusha. So it comes out that the task of the Meshichim, whether it be the Yusoyed or the Shirish, and the task of all Klai Yisrael is in one of those two directions. And therefore, of course, history always puts Klai Yisrael, or rather the Rebbein Shalom, always puts Klai Yisrael in one of those two directions. Either you're being mispashed Kedusha by spreading the name of God, by learning Torah and spreading it, Marbet's Torah, and so on, throughout the entire Bria, or you're always contending with evil, in evil, either by being a tzaddik there or by suffering at the hands of evil. You one or the other. So therefore, all Jews are involved in those two tikkunim, but they derive, or but they are all uh, nitsutsim sort of, or they all derive their ability to masakin from the original shrashim, which arrives their strength from the two fundamental yesodis, ben David or ben Yosef. And both of these two yesodis are embedded in the neshama of Adam Rishon. See the way it goes? And therefore, uh, uh, this is the, so this is the structure. Now, before the Jews came along, that idea of the Yisraelis, Ben David, Ben Yosef, as well as the Shrashim, as well as the Klai Yisrael, if you want to look at that, was Goyim. There was no such thing as Jews. In other words, everybody was involved in those two tikkunim. 
All mankind was involved in those tikkunim. So therefore, you'll always find before Avram that there was always a Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach Medovet, like I showed you, Kain and Hevel. Okay. Then you'll find also that there were different shoshim. You'll find also, well, like, not not Mashiachim because that would have been the end of the tikkun. That then therefore the wouldn't Mashiach. But you'll always find you see this in Shoshim, and you'll find that the rest of the people are contending with one of these two ideas. This is the way it should have been. And the world, all mankind, should have then finally been massacring these Nyanam, right? Taken away, dissipated all the power of evil, and therefore Mespasha Kedusha, and then you would have had your Moisa Mashiach. And you know who would have been your Moisa Mashiach? Who would have been the subjects or the true objects of your Moisa Mashiach? Of course, all mankind. That's what should have been. Because they would have been involved in all these both tikkunim of what has to be done as a result of Adam. However, mankind failed. Nobody was doing it. They had Yechidim that was doing it. Very few people. Like Noyach was a church in Mashiach bin Yosef. And he failed to influence the generation and so on. You didn't, but the, the generation itself was not really doing it. You had Shroshim, you had Yisraelis. But you didn't really have, or you rather you just had a Shroshim, but you didn't have anybody really following it. So therefore the Rebbe decided that he's taking it away from mankind because they refused to do it. He's taking away, he waited 20 generations from Odom to Noach and then from Noach to Avram and nobody responded to the call of being a sucking or contending with evil, not listening to evil, which means on our level, doing the mitzvahs, and stop pandering to evil thoughts and desires and stop doing chatoim. That's what it means in the human level in terms of the avoida. But in terms of what the avoida does, the avoida is masakin those ideas. So therefore, nobody was listening. Until we came to, of course, until we come to Avram Avino. Now, when we get to Avram Avino, Avram was the first one, really, who began doing it in a tremendous sincerity and a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, application of these two ideas? Where do we see that in the life of Adam, of excuse me, of uh, Avram Avinu? Now, by Avram, by Avram, what we see happening is that. Again, like I say, he was the only one at that time who was really mocked the Rebbe Shalom because he fought. He tried to understand. Now, Avram himself, interestingly enough, did both avoidus. What was the both avoidus? He did the avoidus of Ben Yosef because where was he for the first 50 or odd years? In Ur Kazdim. And he was contending with Nimrod, he wanted to throw him into the kitchen, into the fire. So, therefore, what he was doing is again remaining at Sadiq, no matter how much evil you'd pour on top of the man. No matter how much you try to kill the man, he was subjugating evil. Okay, so that's the idea, really, of Ben Yosef. That's the union of the Tikkun of the Chet of Odomishin itself. In other words, Ur Kazdim, which represents the Klippus, means the that was the basic locale of civilization at that time, right? Those are the Klippus. What was that? Like In that? Ur Kazdim, it's uh, Iran. I think it's where Iran is. Yeah, his method of being koif for the Sitra Achra, of course, was stand up to Nimrod and all his people there, and to Afa became believe in the Rabbani Islam. This was the idea of, really, Ben Yosef. After he left ur what was his next job? To spread the idea of the Rabbani Islam throughout the Bria. To be mafas in the Indian of the Rabbani Islam. That's why it says, Avram made Gerim, uh, Sora made uh, Geras and so on, Geras and so on. So therefore, what they were trying to do is mispash Kedusha. That's the idea of who? That's the idea of Ben David. To go throughout the world, then to spread the name of the Rabbeinu Shalom. So we see that Avram was really involved in the Sherish of Ben Yosef and Ben Dovid. And the truth is that Avram really, Avram Avinu had both. He was a Sherish really of Ben Yosef, and he was a Sherish of Ben Dovid. And mainly he was really involved in both ideas. The Ika, however, of Avram was really Ben Dovid, because he was Chesed. Avram was Chesed, kindness. And Chesed is synonymous with Ben David. Okay? Which I'll explain a little more later. So therefore the Iker of Avram of course was Chesed, which really means that Avram in his, in his essence was really a Shurish of the Mashiach Ben David. To Mefarish, to Rebunish them throughout the Bria. But he also had some of the category 
of Ben Yosef. And that's exactly what he was doing. Now, once he did that, what did the Rebbe Nishlam do? He said, ah, you're actually doing my work. Therefore, with you I will make a covenant. A Brisbane Absarum. And that's what begin, that is the, the significance of the Brisbane Absarum is that the Rebbe Nishlam now makes a covenant, agreement with Avram that you will be massacred those in Yonim, A. B, that your children will be massacred in those in Yonim, and C, that only your descendants can massacred. No more Goyim. The Rebbe Hashem took it away from the Goyim and he gave it to Avram and his descendants to massacre those two in Yonim, which again is the major task of all mankind. In other words, the idea of a Tikkun of the Hassan and the Kilkel is now goes only to his descendants. Now why did the Rebbe Hashem make a bris with Avram? There were other tzaddikim in Avram's time. Malkit Tzedek, Noach, there were other, although Rebbe Hashem made a bris with Noach and so on, but there were Hashem Be'eva, there were other tzaddikim in the time of Avram, who were also doing these ideas, misak and these tikkunim. Why did he make it only with Avram? And the answer to that is because only Avram, the Rebbe Hashem felt that only in Avram would he make sure that his descendants would do it also. That's why. And the version is reveals that idea when he says, the man, because Avram will give it to his children after him, that's why I'm going to make a bris with him. Truth is, he could have made a bris with others. But what the version wanted is not only the individual to Messiah, because it needs more than just Avram, as we see clearly that it needs until the Jews in Egypt. So he wanted an individual who would make sure that his descendants would also do it. And apparently nobody met that test, only Avram. So he said Avram, I told Avram, Brisbane Absarum, therefore you are now the tikkunum of the Bria rests in you, which means that that's the contract. You do my avoida, which is the tikkunum, right? Kfir Sarah, after the Chet of Adam Rishon, and also his Pashtas HaKedusha, which is what Adam Rishon should have done. That task is now only to you, to your descendants, and to nobody else. Therefore, so we see therefore that the name Israel went on who? On Avram Avinu. No more did the, the name Israel go on the Umas Oilam. The name Israel now goes only on Avram Avinu. But he was not called Israel. That remained for Yaakov, which we'll see. However, so so then what besides the Brisbane of Sodom, the um, the name must change to indicate that. If a man enters significantly if into a contract with the Rishon, he must be called something also. He becomes Yisrael, but the Rishon does not call him Yisrael yet. He waits till Yaakov, which we'll see. But he's got to change the name of Avram, and he does. What does the Rishon do? Of course, he gives him the bris, which is the sign in flesh of the entire covenant between a man and the Rishon. That is the Yisui, the sign. Therefore, that finalizes the agreement. Here's the agreement, and here's now the sign of the agreement, actually in the body of mankind. And the second idea uh, is that the reversion changes Avram's name. What does he change it to? Until now, Avram was called Avram, Aleph Beis Reish Mem, which means Av, the father of Aram, of Armenia, means uh, Iraq, means ur He's only a, a father in other words, he was the, in other words, the place where he came from derived their sustenance from the Kedusha of Avram. But that was only a local, it was only a local uh, father or authority or ruler. Now he became Avraham, forget the Reish, because that remained. But Avraham is al Bey's Reish, forget, and Hamem. So it's av Hamoin Goyim. He became the father of a multitude of nations. He now became the father of all mankind. Why? Because if he was going to massacre those Nyanim, that would correct the Bria. Right? And who would benefit? All mankind. So therefore, all mankind is blessed for you because you're the one who's going to massacre it. So therefore, Avram did have a name change. That no one was the father or give the Hashpah to Aram from where he came, now he would be the father of all mankind, which means that he would be massacring those tikkunim, and all mankind would benefit, therefore, and that's the contract, therefore he's called Avraham. This is the idea, why he was called Avraham, uh, instead of Avram.
Now, now, not only did that name change, of course, occur to Avram, it also occurred to Sarah, because she was also part of the Tikkun, which means that until now she was called Sarai, my princess, with local. Now it's Soro, the princess, general, throughout the entire Bria. So therefore, Avram got a name change, and Soro got a name change, to reflect the new contract, which means the new conditions, or the new significance of the Nishamas. That they have the Tikkunim to give down, not only to themselves, but throughout the entire Bria. Now, the Rabbanishim, so you shouldn't think that maybe the Rabbanishim, he discarded the Goyim at that point, name. He still gave him another chance because the Medrash says that when he was going to give him the Torah, the Klai Israel, okay, he went around to each nation of the world and offered them the Torah, and each nation rejected it for whatever reason, okay. Uh, he gave one to Yishmo, and they rejected it because uh, Geneva, Le Signa, said, Who oh, we still, we don't want it. He went to Esav, he said, What is it saying? So they said to him, What does it say there? So he said, Le Sirtzach, you can't kill. He said, well, I'm sorry, we live on Achera, we live on Kilim, and so on. Each nation he gave it to, and of course the only nation who accepted it was Klai Israel, and they said Nasa Vinishma. It wasn't only acceptance, it was a superlative acceptance. The way they did it was incredible. But in any case, what, what does that mean? It means that each, what, what it means, you, what, you can learn two different shatim, because we don't find that God went around to different nations. What it means is that each nation, perhaps there were leaders in that, those people who were trying to, you know, talk about morality and turning them back to the good, and the nation didn't heed. So therefore that was a chance again for the nation to listen to the right derach. Or what it also could have meant, and this is much more, what, what's more probable, is that the Rebbe and Matan Torah went through every nation and looked at its kuchus, how low it was in Tumah. And he saw, if he gives them the Torah, would they be able to keep it? So he saw that every nation in the world had degraded themselves in terms of their Tumah, how much they were a representative of Sitra Akram, to such an extent where even if he gave them the Torah, they couldn't get out of the quicksand. They couldn't get out of the mud that they were in. And the only one who was possible was Klai Israel. Even though they had gone through 49 levels of Tumah, which they had done in Mitzrayim, but it was possible for Klai Israel to do it. And lo and behold, they did. In 49 days, they made, they made an incredible reversal. It just shows you the Koyach of Klai Israel when it comes to Kedusha. Because, and that's all because of the, uh, the Hashpor of Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov, the 10 Shvatim, the 12 Shvatim, and so on. But the Goyim, it was seen, Ruchni, spiritually, that they couldn't do it. So that's what it means. That he went around to each nation to see if they could be involved in the Torah and the Dikunim. But unfortunately, they had strayed too far. That was the last chance the Goyim had to come back into the fold or to be involved in the Dikunim. To Masak and the Bria. After that, it was sealed forevermore that that's it. They can no more come back as a nation, they can only come back as individuals if they want to become a Ger or a Gyrus. That's the only, each person still can do that, be Masakin, but no more as a nation, only as individual. Now we begin to see the power of Christ's The only nation on earth that can Masakin the Bria is Christ's realm. And Tikkun means God coming in the Bria and out of the Bria. If you recall, I talked many Shurim before on Simpson. That's what it means. Through the Avodah, you must suck in all the Kilkulim and the Chesrenes of the Bria. And therefore, you bring the Rebbe Nishlam back into the Bria. The only ones who can affect the Rebbe Nishlam that way is the only ones who have their hands on the lever. And the lever, of course, are, is the Avodah, the Mitzvahs, and so on. But what the lever does is it controls the tikkunim. It means, is the Bria back in a stage of kilkul or not? The only ones who have that power are Jews. A goy cannot move the or masak and the kunim not one billionth of a, of a meter. Because that's not his tafkid. That's the tafkid of Jews. They had that until Avram and perhaps even, and of course even until Mount Terah. After Mount Terah, they can make not one move for the tikkun. Only Christ does that. That's why Jews are so awesomely powerful. And that's why the whole history is nothing more than to structure itself to make sure that the Jews have their tikkunim to massacre. It's like it's, everything is 
It's like a waiter waiting on Klai Yisrael that they should be able to pesach in the Bria. So every historical moment, make sure that it is of that kind of a framework, a situation where the tikkunim of Kilkulim and Chesan will be realized. That's the power of a Jew, which we see once the Rebbe made the bris, of course, with Avram and with no other nation. What would be, therefore, what would be is that the tachas of the goyim is to follow the Jews, to allow the Jews to show them the correct derech, to be involved in that tikkun by enabling the Jews to be masak in the bria. This would be their tafkid. And for that, they would get ulam habo also, because they would have also have helped to masak in it by enabling the Jews to masak in it. So the ones who do the tikkun are the Jews, but the assistance by the goyim would be the eschus to get Ulam Habo, so they would get Ulam Habo indirectly. Unfortunately, the Goyim not only don't they assist their Jews, they prevent it, make it impossible for the Jews to do their Tikkun. So it wasn't for the fact that the Rabbi Yishlam himself has to make sure that history will always make sure the Jews will be Masakin, because you can't look for the Goyim for assistance. So the Rabbi has to counter the negative effects of a Goy and provide the, the uh, possibility of the Jews being Masakin the Bria. So therefore the Goyim killed their own Ulam Habo by making it impossible for the Jews to be Masak in the Bria. And if it wasn't for the Rebbe Shalom, that he enables the Jews to be Masak in the Bria, then there would be never a Tikkun. So the Goyim of course have a murdig, murdig claim against them. In Ulam Habo, in, in, and that's the whole Gemara of that there will be a tremendous debate between Khan Yisrael and the Goyim. And the Goyim will be vanquished because not only did they not Masakin help Klai Yisrael, they prevented Klai Yisrael from bringing the Dikunim. Therefore they had no Chilik and Ilam Habor for those Goyim. But for those Goyim who did help Klai Yisrael, they will tak a in Ilam Habor as an appendage to Klai Yisrael. Indirectly, because they were an indirect influence on the Tikkun of the Bria. Now, this week, I just want to give a, a brief review of what we had covered last week. <clears throat> it comes out that there are basically three questions, two of which we have dealt with when we examine really the uh, Jewish philosophical structure, the Hashkofa system. The first idea is <clears throat> who is the Masakin? Who is that group of individuals which the Rabbanishan wants that will succeed in tackling the task and overcoming it and therefore getting Ulam Habo. So who is the Masakin? And, we, we, uh, we, and until now, I've spoken about exactly what needs Tikkun, what needs a correction. But I'll explain that just briefly later. But in any case, so the first question is, who is the Masakin? Who is that group of individuals who have assumed the obligation or responsibility and have entered into an agreement with the Rebbe Nishlodom to do the job that he wants and thereby get Ulam Habo? The second question is, what needs Tikkun? What is the task? What is the job that the Rebbe has designated for this, in the, these group, this group to do? What is the Tikkun? What is that job? And the third idea is, what is the method to Masakin? By what method does one actually correct? These are the three questions. And right now, I'm going to quickly review what we have discovered in terms of who is the Masakin. And the second is, what is it that needs Tikkun? And in terms of what is the method, I will go after we finish the others because that, uh, based on that idea, is what the entire idea of Goyim and Jews are, in terms of what is the method. But in any case, we have discovered last week, or we've seen last week, that Yisrael is a concept. The idea of Israel is a concept that is applied to that group of individuals who have assumed the obligation to do what the Rebbe Shalom wants. And whoever that group is, that is who Yisrael is. Now, therefore, before the Chet of Odom Rishon, who was Yisrael? Who was Yisrael the, the, the one who would be Masakin? Because whoever is Masakin, whoever corrects the job that has to be done, by, which has been designated by the Rebbe Shalom, they are called the Masakin, they are called Yisrael, Israel. So who was Israel? Israel was Odom Rishon. That was who the name Israel first devolved upon. And what would be, Adam Rishon means that Adam Rishon and all men that would come out of Adam Rishon. What would be the Tikkun? What needs correction? The answer is Tikkun of the Chassan. To correct the deficiency in the universe that was created by the Rebbe 
In other words, what was created by the Rav Shalom was a hester yechudai, a concealment of his unity. Therefore, the tikkun is to memagal yechudai. That's the chesar, the original deficiency. Therefore, before the chet of Adam Rishon, the, the concept of Yisrael, which is synonymous with the concept of the Masakin, who is the one who is going to correct whatever deficiency is, is put before them, devolved upon Adam Rishon and all men, and the task or the tikkun itself was to Masakin the Chassar. Now, the concept of Yisrael after the chet still devolved on all men. In other words, even though Adam Rishon did the chet, Yisrael was still Adam Rishon and all men. There was no such thing as Jews or Goyim. It was still all men. But now, the Tikkun, or that which needed correction, was now of a double nature. The first thing that had to be Niskan, or corrected, was the Hester, the concealment of the presence of God, which man contributed by doing the Chet, because by doing the Chet, in effect, he concealed the presence of the God even further. Therefore, he had to undo that concealment. He had to remove the amount he contributed to the original state of Hester in the universe. That's the tikkun of Kilkel. Kilkel is the damage that man did. And the second tikkun that man needed was the original tikkun of Chesar, which is the amount of concealment of God's presence which God himself had put into the universe in order to give man a task of understanding the nature of the Rabban Islam. So therefore... After the Chet of Adam Rishon, the concept of Yisrael devolved on still on all men, and the tasks were now two instead of one. The first task was to correct or undo the Hester that man contributed to the universe, the Hester Yehudoi of God that he contributed to the universe as a result of his sin, which is called Kilkul, Tikkun of Kilkul. And the second task of man was now the Tikkun of Chesan, which is the original amount of deficiency or the original amount of concealment of God's presence which God contributed put into the universe in order to allow man to have a task in which he can labor at and therefore get Ulam Habo. Therefore the concept of Yisrael again devolved on all men still but now included two tasks Tikkun of Kilkul and Tikkun of Chesan. The third idea is that again you notice there's a changing concept of Yisrael it's already changed once First it started with all men, Tikkun of Hassan. Now it's all men, Tikkun of Kilkel and Hassan. It changed a third time, or rather a second time. And that was that after Avram Avinu, no more would all men be able to masakin. No more would all men be able to undo the amount of concealment of God's presence that man had contributed to the universe and the rebellion had contributed, now only Avram Avinu and his descendants. And that is really what the nature of a Jew is. In other words, the concept Yisrael, which means that that group of individuals who will assume the responsibility of bringing the presence of the rebellion into the Bria where all men know of the knowledge of God, that's the task of man, to recognize the supreme authority of the rebellion, that task would now be done only by Avram, as I had mentioned last week. And which means that Avram Avinu now has the concept of Yisrael. The idea or the terminology, the term called Israel, now applies only to Avram and to his descendants. No more to the rest of mankind, because they had been not doing anything for 20 generations. So therefore, they were not doing anything in terms of realizing who the Rebbe Shalom is. So therefore, the Rebbe gave it to Avram Avinu because of his work. Therefore, the concept of Yisrael, since Avram, has now devolved upon Avram and his descendants, namely the Jews. And the correction, the tikkun, that which needs the task, that which needs to be corrected, is the kilkul, which means the amount of contribution that man has done to the concealment of God's presence as a result of his chatoim. And the original chesam, which is the amount of Hester of God, God's unity, which had been contributed by the Rebbe himself, in order to give man the task in the first place. Therefore, we now see that Yisrael changed in terms of who it changed twice. One was all men, and then became Jews. The original task of man was to masakin the chesam, and now it became to masakin the chesam and the kilkel. So this is the changes that had occurred. This I had spoken of actually last week. Now, if you recall, 
What does Tikkun Chasson and Tikkun of Kilku mean? Or rather, how does one go about it? As a result of man's sin, what he did is he introduced evil, which is the Yetzirah, that Malach which is in charge of all the affairs that try to seduce men to sinning, that influence entered the universe in the form or into the body of man. Before it was a snake and now it became internalized in the body of man. Now man carries around his own evil inclination in his own mind. So therefore this wherever. So therefore the Sitra Achra, which is the Yet Sahara, or the Malchamavas, whatever you want to call them, now is internally in the physical universe itself. Therefore, one must rem- this was the effect of the Chet of Odom. Therefore, one must remove the evil or the Yet Sahara, and the way you do that is by battling the Yet Sahara and subjugating him and using him for Kedusha. That's called Kfiyas HaSitra Achra, to subjugate, subdue the Yet Sahara and to remain righteous and therefore then subjugate the Yet Sahara and he has no more power in terms of his effect. That is the way you are Masak in the Kilkul. And you Masak in the Chassan by spreading Kedusha. In other words, once you've battled the Eight Sahara and you've won over him, you now spread the name of God throughout the entire world. And you promote the belief in God. This is the, what's called his Pasha's Kedusha. So that's what Tikkun Kilkul is and that's what Tikkun Chassan is. Now, therefore, we see so far is how the concept of Israel changed and which means who is the Masakin because the universe was created for those individuals who would correct the deficiency in the universe and what the Tikkun was that also changed now when we say that that Yisrael of course is the concept of who can correct the damage and the Chasson and the Bria that means that I don't care who it is. I don't care if before the advent of Avram, which means all men, or after the advent of Avram, which means Avram and Jews. Those are obviously the different groups that could do or uh, correct what the Rebbe Nishlam himself had put into the universe. Basically, it means the Shroshim, which I had mentioned, the Mashiach ben Yosef, and the Mashiach ben David. Those are the two main Nishamas, which are involved in two different kinds of activities. And the second, it means Jews, all Jews, which are working in one of two, those two directions also. So when you talk about who is the one who is Masakin, who corrects the Hester or the concealment of the presence of God, you always talk about one of two individuals, either Mishichos of Ben Yosef, who is involved in correcting the damage to the Bria, the Kilkum, or the Mishichos of Ben Dovid, who is who's, who's involved in correcting the uh, Chesan of the Bria. And together, all Israel, all Jews are involved in one or the other. Either they're battling the Eight Sahara within the Eight Sahara himself, and they're trying to subjugate the Eight Sahara, or they're trying to spread the idea of terror throughout. These are always the idea with, in terms of what Jews are involved in. That's in terms of the Masakin. Now, to get to Avram Avinu, which is where we le- le- left off last week, if you recall, Avram Avinu battled both. Because in the beginning he was in Ur Kazdim, in Ur of the Chaldees, right? And in there his job was to remain at Sadiq even though all around him was tremendous evil, right? So what is that? That's to battle the Eight Sahara and to subdue him and to remain from re- religious, righteous. That's exactly what Avram did. He was in Ur Kazdim, he refused to let the, the influence of, of Chaldea to, uh, uh, to uh, influence him, right? And he battled and remained at Sadiq. So therefore, what was he, he's doing there was the Kfiyas Ra, was subjugating the evil in ur Kazdim. The second job, of course, is once he went to Eretz Yisrael, he was spreading the name of God throughout the entire world. Wherever he went, he would always use it as an as a, uh, as uh, opportunity to spread the name of God. This was the whole idea of Eshachnos Ocham. So therefore, this was the Hispashtis Kedusha, of course, throughout. And this is what the second task which Avram did. As a result of that, we now come to the idea that the Rabbi Nishlam decided to make a covenant with Avram. What was the covenant that the Rabbi Nishlam made with Avram? He made an agreement with him. He said, since you are doing the jobs that have to be done, in other words, you are actively engaged in fighting the Eight Sahara, 
being religious even in a non-religious environment and you're also spreading the word of God I will now make the agreement with you that you are the one as a result of this tasks that you're doing you are the ones who will correct the entire situation in the universe therefore the reversal made the Brisbane absurd and that's what it symbolizes that now Avram Avinu and he and he only and his descendants can actually engage in repairing the job that was originally uh, put into the universe which became the task of man so this is what the Brisbane of Sarum signifies that the concept of Yisrael now devolves only upon Avram and his descendants which means remember what does Yisrael mean that they are the only ones who can massacre the Bria before the Rebbeinu decided to enter into an agreement where Avram and his descendants would be the individuals or group of individuals that would do this job and therefore get Olam Habo. So as I said, the concept of Israel, Jew, which actually means Israel, actually the concept of Israel devolved upon Avram and his descendants. Now, therefore the Rebbe Hashem says to Avram, V'nivrechu b'cho, and in you shall be blessed all the nations of the earth. Why? Because since you are actually correcting the original state you are bringing God back into the universe and that is a blessing for the entire universe and you're the only one who can do it therefore all nations will be blessed through you because you're the only one who can do it so therefore all nations will receive their blessing as a result of your task of bringing God back into the universe that's why it's all the nations will be blessed in you now the Rebbe therefore made an agreement with Avram what was that agreement? that you and your offspring you and your offspring, you and your descendants are the ones who will be massacred, correct both deficiencies, right? Which would mean that you will remove the concealment of God's presence and you will reveal the presence of God. That's called Gili Yechudai, of course, which means the revelation of the unity of God. And as a result of that, you will get Olam Habo. And in Olam Habo, what's that? That you will experience the unity of God in the exact amount that you brought him into the universe so therefore that's the agreement you correct the deficiencies of the universe and deficiencies being that there is a concealment of my presence you bring me, you bring me back into the universe and as a result of that in Olam Habo I will, the version will reveal himself to, the, to that individual in the exact amount that he revealed God to the universe it's a measure for a measure Okay, and this is the agreement that the Rebbe Hashanah made with Avram and to all his descendants after him. In other words, you remove the concealment of Kilku, the original damage, and the concealment of Chesarn, which is the first damage. And if you remove the Hester, instead you are Megal Yehuda, you reveal the presence and the unity of God, you will experience that unity that you yourselves reveal in Olam Haba. This was the agreement that the Rebbe Hashanah made with Avraham Avinu by Brisbane Absalom. That is the significance of the Brisbane Absalom. Now, therefore, that was the agreement that the Rebbe Hashanah made with Avraham. Look at the significance of that agreement. That's what it means. It means that God, the Rebbe Hashanah, took away the ability of everybody to do the job that man was created for in the beginning, which is to recognize the supreme authority of God. Now he gave it only to Avraham. Of course, a guy can recognize the supreme authority of God, but nothing happens in the universe as a result. God does not be, go in or out of the universe as a result of a, a guy's actions. That's what it means. Only as a result of a Jew's actions. And I had mentioned last week that God still left it open to goyim in terms of they become gerim. If a guy wants to enter that activity that the Jew has, Therefore, he can become Jewish. This is the way he can become involved. But as a nation, he can no more. Nations can no more assume the entire obligation that the Jews have. Only individuals of a particular nation. Therefore, therefore, the Rebbe told Avram that uh, at that time, at the Brisbane of Saram, as I had mentioned previously, that your your descendants will be slaves in a land that they do not know. Four hundred and some odd years, right? Why did the Rebbe tell that to Avram? Because when he gave this job to Avram and he said, you're the only one that can actually correct the situation, the fact that I'm concealed from the universe, okay? What the Rebbe is telling him in effect is that I want not only you to correct it, but your descendants 
and in a very short while I want the Mashiach to come. And I had mentioned to you that when the Jews went out of Egypt, had they not done the sin of the ego, then the Yemoisa Mashiach, the Messianic era, would have started then, not now as we have to wait for it. Therefore, at the time you make an agreement with somebody, you have to spell out all the conditions of the agreement. Since the agreement that God was making with Avram was that you and your descendants can fix all the damage and deficiencies in the universe and therefore usher in the messianic era, because that's what the Yemaisa Mashiach is, it comes after all the tikkunim have been done. Therefore the Rabbi Shem says, and also your children will have to be in Egypt, he didn't name the nation of course, for so many, so, uh, such and such amount of years, and as a result of that, the entire tikkun will have been accomplished. And you can get the Yemais Mashiach. And the truth is, that's exactly what almost happened, if it wasn't for the chet of the ego. But I had spoken about this in previous shurim. Now, getting back to Avram, so that's the significance of Brisbane of Sarm. Very important to understand. Most people don't understand the significance of what it was that Rav Hashem did with Avram. And that's really what it was. Now, where do we see that in a profound way in the Chumash? That Rav Hashem made this covenant with Avram. And not only that, that he made the covenant, but also, of course, that um, he insisted, of course, on having his descendants also as part of the covenant and so on. The Torah says, the Torah, the Torah says that the Rav Hashem com- commanded Avram to do the bris milah. To have the ritual of circumcision. Right after that, right at the end of it, it says that God finished speaking with Avram. God finished talking with Avram after commanding him the mitzvah of bris milah. And it says, Vayal Elokim mi al Avram. And God ascended from upon Avram. That's the literal translation of the Chumash. Now, Chazal say that, Chazal asks a question. They say, what do you mean, Vayal Elokim me al Avram? And God ascended from upon Avram. What do you mean, he went, he, it sounds like God was on his back. And then after he commanded him the mitzvah of Mila, he, he went off his back. It sounds like God was riding on top of Avram, because it says he ascended from upon him. It sounds like he was upon him before, which means on top of him, and then he ascended. That's a very unusual lotion. It should say that God ascended next to Avram, or away from Avram. What do you mean he ascended from upon Avram? The lotion distinctly says that God was riding on Avram. That's what, literally what it means. So Chazam tells us one of the most fundamental principles of all. And that is that from here we learn out that the Ovois, which is Avram Yitzhak Nyakov and uh, Avram Yitzhak Nyakov, they are the Merkova, the chariot of God. Okay, which means, in other words, it's like God rides Avram as like a driver rides a chariot. So therefore, Chazal learned that since it says God ascended from upon Avram, it means that Avram is the chariot of God, the Merkova. Okay, that the others, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and now it's talking about Avram, is the chariot of God. This is the way Chazal call it. What does that mean? What is the significance of the fact that you call a tzaddik or Avram a chariot? What does that mean? Not only that, once we understand what a chariot is, we'll understand some ideas of what Yechezkel Hanovi saw in the Maisim Merkava. Remember there was a whole image, he saw a chariot in the sky, and he saw four wheels and fiery angels and so on. What does all that really mean? Well, we'll go into a little of it, and you'll begin to see what the symbolism of that really conveys the fundamental structure of the entire universe in terms of what must be. But in any case, right now we see that the Chazal learned out from Vayal Lekim El Avram that Avram is the chariot of God because it says he ascended from upon Avram means he got off him, okay? Which means he was on top of him until he ascended. So the question of course is what is the significance of the fact that Chazal called Avram Avinu a chariot, a Merkava? Second, what is the significance that the fact that God that we that God says he got off Avram after he gave him the mitzvah of Mila? Okay? Second idea. Now, let's go into the Merkava. It's the ideas in the Merkava are, like I said, are very profound. 
and they're very important to understand. And they themselves, it's like they are a model of the entire universe, what must go on. Now, the Merkava itself has two fundamental ideas embedded into it, from the nature of a chariot. Okay? <coughs> what is the purpose of a chariot, a Merkava? Let's look at that first. The purpose of a chariot, today you look at it in terms of a car, but, but in those days they had chariots, right? They had chariots instead of uh, cars or modern weapons of war or whatever. You know, it was their methods of, uh, well, that's the, really the purpose. The purpose of a chariot is what? To convey the driver to his destination point. It's a vehicle. That's what a chariot is. A chariot is a method, a vehicle, by which an individual can go from one place to another. That's what a chariot is. Okay? So it's, uh, it, the Merkava, it conveys the driver to his destination. That's what a chariot is. What does that mean? Well, who is the chariot and who is the driver? We see that Hashem, the Rebbe Shalom, is the driver, because Vayal, he's the one who ascended, and Avram is the chariot. Right? So we see who the symbolism of who the chariot and who the driver is. What does that mean? If the purpose of a chariot is to bring the driver to his destination, right? What's the purpose then of Avram to do to Rebbe Shalom? Is to bring God to his destination. Mm-hmm. What's the destination of the Rebbe Shalom? To come back into the universe. That the Rebbe Shalom's presence should be revealed again into the world where it was hidden purposely to give man a, a task to do. So therefore, the idea of chariot is that the Rebbe Shalom's presence should come back into the world, back into creation, to bring God back into the Bria. This is the idea of what the chariot is. Because the chariot conveys the driver to his destination, and the destination of God, of course, is to where he's not, Kaviyochel, because God really is all places. But we do not perceive him in this universe, so therefore it's as if God is not here, so therefore the destination point of God is to come back into this universe, and therefore man recognizes the presence of God throughout all creation. So that is the purpose of Avram, to bring the Rebbe Shalom back into the Bria, Okay, that's why Avram is a Merkava. He's a chariot because he's the vehicle by which God will ultimately go back into the Bria. Now, when God goes back into the Bria, what does that mean? That means Giliyahuda. It means the unity of God is completely revealed throughout the entire universe. So it comes out again that chariot is a metaphor for the task of Avram, the task or the purpose of a chariot. It's again to bring the driver to his point of destination. The task of Avram, metaphorically, is to bring God to his destination from where he is not perceived to be, namely this earth and the entire universe, to bring him back into the universe where we perceive the driver, we perceive the unity or the presence of the Rebbe Nishlam. So therefore, that Sadi is the chariot of God, He's a chariot for God. He is the emtsoi, he is the vehicle, he is the means, the method, by which God is revealed in this world and all creation. That is exactly the relationship between the tzaddik and, and, uh, and the Rebbe Nishlam. Now, besides that, what does that convey? So, in other words, we see that the Merkava's purpose, right, is God's destination. That's, that's the purpose of the Merkava. Which means to remove the concealment of God's presence. As a result of the kilkel of man, which is the amount of deficiency that man contributed, and also as a result, a result of the chasan, because of God's initial deficiency. So therefore, when it says that the chariot brings God to creation, and therefore it's depicted that God is riding a chariot, it means that the, Rebbe, the task of the chariot or the task of Avram is to bring the Rebbe Shalom into the Bria, and as a result of that, the concealment dissipates, is no more. Instead of concealment of God's presence, there is now giloi, a revelation of His presence, which means that the two tikkunim, or the two of Buddhists have to be done, which again, 
first tikkun is to remove the kilkul, to remove the, defi- the deficiency as a result of man's actions, that's the damage, and then to remove the deficiency as a result of God's actions, that he himself originally was deficient in the universe. So therefore the hester as a result of man and the hester as a result of God's actions has to be removed and it's removed as a result of Avram's actions and therefore Avram is symbolized as a chariot. That is the first purpose of a chariot to bring the, is to bring the Rebbe Shalom into the Bria. Now, the second idea of chariot is operationally. How does a chariot work? A chariot works by adopting the will of the driver. Chariot has no will of its own. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Who, the, only, the chariot responds to the will of the driver. Okay? Therefore, in other words, operationally, a chariot works by responding to the will of the driver, therefore gets to the destination of the driver. What does that mean? Since the chariot is a metaphor for Avram, therefore Avram must adapt the will of God completely and then he will get it to his destination. Right? So therefore the way the chariot works is by uh, subjugating its, its will. Of course the chariot has no will, it's an inanimate object. But in terms of, if it could have a will, it would have to subjugate its will to the will of the driver. And then it can get somewhere, because then the driver can lead it. The same idea. Avram Avinu, who has a will of his own, just like all men, and who has free will, who can initiate whatever they want, they can do whatever they want, have to adopt the will of God, the Ratzel of the Rabbani Shlodim, And then they can bring the Rabbani Shlodim into the Bria. And if you recall... The idea of the adapting the rotsen of the Rebbein Shalom is the essence of the Avodah. The whole task of a man doing a mitzvah means what? That I will not do what I want, I will do what the Rebbein Shalom wants me to do. So whose will are you adopting? You're adopting the Rebbein Shalom's will. That's the task of man. By adapting the will of God, so God says, since you proclaim that I am the only one in the universe, because you say... I will do your will. Therefore, I will now get closer to the universe in accordance with your statement. You testify to the unity of God by doing a mitzvah, because that's what you do when every time you do a mitzvah, you testify to his unity. Therefore, God responds on his side and he says, I will come back into the universe as a result of your testimony. If you testify to the contrary, that you do a sin which says that I want to do what I want, not what God wants. So what you're really saying is, I'm also a boss. I'm also somebody. I don't have to do what you want. I'm also somebody. So what you're really saying is that God is not the supreme being because you have a right. You are entitled to do your own will. So therefore what you're saying is that the Rebbe is not supreme. So the Rebbe as a result of that, removes himself from the Bria. It's meter connected meter, measure for measure. God subjugates his actions to the actions of man. If man proclaims his unity, God comes into the universe. If man proclaims his own greatness, then God leaves the universe. So therefore, the essence of the work that a man does is to adopt the will of God. And that is a complete testimony that the Rabbani Shalom is supreme. Therefore, Avram has to be a chariot, which operationally means that if you want to bring God into the universe, which is what a chariot does, then you also have to work like a chariot. And a chariot only works at the beckoning of its driver. If the driver doesn't make the move to go, the chariot stands still. The same idea, the horses stand still, which drive the chariot. Therefore, you have to act operationally like a chariot to adopt the will of God. Then God moves into the Bria. If you don't adopt the will of the Rebbe then of course the chariot doesn't move and the Rebbe never gets to his destination, which means that the Hester, the concealment of God's presence, continues. That's the idea, the two fundamental ideas in the metaphor of the Merkava, the chariot. So when the Rebbe said to Avram, you are the chariot, and he indicated that by saying that he got off him, he was saying to Avram that you can bring me into the universe, which means you can remove all that concealment, that darkness, and you can bring me in, and people will recognize the presence of God. That's the function of a chariot. That's what it's for, the purpose. And operationally, the way you'll do it is by adapting your will to mind the way a chariot 
and its horses does to the driver. So the Bereshit was telling him two things. That you, the, your purpose is to bring me into the uni- universe. That's the purpose. And the method is to adopt my Ratzin. Two messages to Avram. That's the significance of a chariot. So we see that a, a Merkava is a profound metaphor for the whole purpose of a Jew. And that is that the Jew's purpose now, after Avram, before it was all mankind's purpose, that the whole purpose of the Jew is to bring the Rebbe Shalom back into the Bria, and that's what a chariot does, and back into the Bria means to remove both deficiencies, the concealment as a result of man's contribution by his chet, and the concealment as a result of God's contribution, the initial stage of the universe. And the second idea is that how are you going to do this? How are you going to get God back into the universe? Megali Chudoi, by adopting the will of the driver, which means to do his mitzvahs and proclaim his unity, therefore God Taka, or in reality, does come back into the universe. That's why Avram is called a Merkava. That's the idea of Merkava, a chariot. Now, if we follow it completely, then the Merkava. Chazal say that the, in, in, in Cheskel when he saw the Merkava that, that he had, it had four wheels mm-hmm. or four, four images at the bottom instead of four wheels. The first wheel or the wheel, the four wheels, one was the, a lion, one was an ox, one was the face of a man, one was the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of a man, and the face of an eagle. This was the bottom, the wheels of the chariot. Mm-hmm. What are wheels? Those are the wheels, those are the actual support, and they are the ones that move the chariot. That's the essence of the mobility of the chariot. So therefore, just to, uh, to understand three of them, who is the Shor, the face of the ox? Who is Shor symbolized? Yeah. Sheikh ben Yosef. Now you begin to understand what's going on, because that's one major tikkun, one major task of man, is Yosef, is Yosef, which is symbolized by the ox, because you, well, Yosef by Yosef it says Bechor Shorei Hadaloi, it says in in the, all in the end of the Chumash, right? In Vezoy Sabrocho, that when uh, Moshe blessed each tribe, each uh, right Shevet, it, on Yosef he says Bechor Shorei Hadaloi that the beauty of the ox, the firstborn of his ox, beauty is his. He calls Yosef an ox. That's the animal that symbolizes Yosef. So therefore, shore on the Merkava means the task of what Yosef has to do, which is to remove the damage or the concealment of God's presence that was contributed by man. Why is Yosef symbolized by an ox? What's the purpose of an ox? An ox works the ground. Mm-hmm. Remember, plow the, plow the earth. Remember what the metaphor by yeah. Cain was? What was Cain? Cain was an Oved Adoma. Remember I told you that Cain was an Oved Adoma, he worked the ground? And I said that that was a metaphor for the Mashiach ben Yosef, because the Mashiach ben Yosef works the ground. Why? Because he's got to remove the earth, remove the physicality that man got as a result of his chet. So Shaw indicates Mashiach ben Yosef, which indicates the tikkun of ben Yosef, that ben Yosef has to massacre him. Okay, Masakin the Kilkel, and the way he does that, of course, is he subjugates the Sitra Achro, the fierce Sitra Achro. And the reason why it's symbolized by the shore ox, because an ox works the ground just like we see, works very hard, just like we see that Kayan was an Ivid Adoma. And just like the Indian of Kayan was Mashiach ben Yosef, that job, the same idea, the shore on the Merkava is that's the job of man. There you are, sitting right under the Merkava, the idea of shore. What's the second idea, the second image under the Merkava is the Ari, the lion. We all know the lion is David, Yehuda, Guraye, right? Yehuda. So the second, so the Ari symbolized the Tikkun of Ben David, right? Which is to remove the Chassan, the original deficiency of man. That's the Hispashtus of Kedusha, that's the tremendous spreading out or extension of holiness. This is the idea of the Ari, that that's the second tikkun that's needed to convey God back into the universe. First tikkun is Ben Yosef, the second tikkun is Ben David, which is symbolized by the lion, the Ari. 
Why is the lion, why does the Ari, the symbol of Ben David? Because the Ari proclaims majesty and kingship wherever it goes. The, uh, the lion is the king of the jungle in terms of its incredible, beautiful appearance. It looks like a melech. So therefore, the idea of Malchus is uh, uh, symbolized by a lion. So that the task of the Mashiach bin David is to proclaim the kingship of God throughout the Bria. The Malchus of the Rebbe throughout the Bria. To spread the Kedusha, which is the kingship of God, throughout the Bria. You see? So therefore, Shor represents Ben Yosef, which is to work the ground, to remove the Sitra Achva, to subjugate it. And the lion is to spread. The lion roams wherever he goes, right? He roams through Africa as a king. He spashed this Kedusha to spread out royalty throughout the land, just like the lion wanders throughout the land. The lion is royalty. That's why these two animals symbolize the Sheikh bin David and the Sheikh bin Yosef. Or they symbolize the two different kinds of jobs that Jews have to do. That's why God made a lion and made an ox, not the reverse. Not that since you have an ox that works on the ground and a lion that goes around like a king, therefore God used these as symbols for the Mashiach ben Dovid and Mashiach ben Yosef. No. Because two tikkunim are needed, that means working on the ground, which means removing evil out of the body of man, and to proclaim majesty throughout, therefore an animal like the lion and the ox were created, reversed, that's where the Torah works. They were created as animals representing those two tasks of the Jew. The third image was the image of Odom, was the face of a man. What does that mean? Because who does those two tikkunim? Who is the instrument, the one who has free will, who has to do these two tasks? Man. That's who has to do it. So therefore the chariot will move as a result of man. So man doing the tikkun of Shor, Ben Yosef, and the tikkun of the Ari, Ben Dovid, that is what moves the chariot, because those are the wheels. That is what moves the chariot and conveys the Rabbani Shalom into the Bria. And whose face do you think was on the chariot? Who's, it says the face of a man. Yeah. Whose face was that? It was yeah. Yaakov. Yeah. Why was it Yaakov? Chazal say that Yaakov had the beauty of Odd mm -hmm. Right? So therefore, whose face was supposed to be originally on the Merkava? Odd Right? Because he was the original one who had the term Yisrael. After he lost it, who got it? Who was the one who was called Yisrael finally? Yeah. Yaakov. So therefore, Chazal and Merames, by telling you that Yaakov has the beauty of Odom Rishon, which means that Yaakov finally internalized, or in him gelled the concept of Yisrael, and therefore he was called Yisrael, right? From Odom Rishon. That's why he looked similar to Odom, because he took over what Odom should have done. He became Yisrael. So therefore, the face of the Merkava is no more Odom, it's Yaakov of Vinu. And the, the Chazal say that how we know it's Yaakov of Vinu? Because by the Sulam, when the angels were going up by the ladder, when Yaakov had a dream after he went out from Beersheba, and he was going to Choron, he slept and he had a dream, the ladder, the, Jacob's ladder, right? And he saw angels going up and down, and God was standing on, its, on the side. So the idea is to the Chazal and Chulun say, Masech the Chulun, that the angels were going up and they looked at the Dmus, the, the image of Yaakov, up in the Mala, which means in the Merkava, and then they came down and they saw him sleeping on the ground. They saw him, you know, so they, were, they saw Yaakov in both places, the image of Yaakov. So therefore Chazal learned that the image of Merkava was Yaakov, right? And again, the reason why it is Yaakov is because since Yaakov now has the concept of Israel, no more Odom who had it before, therefore Yaakov looked like Odom, or he had the Shufra, the Odom, the beauty of Odom, yet the image was Yaakov because now he was Israel. And what is the concept or the definition of Israel? Those group of individuals who can do the Tikkunim, Ben Yosef or Ben Dovid, who can correct both deficiencies, the deficiency of the Hester caused by man, and the deficiency or the Hester, uh, the deficiency caused by God. Those are the two tasks of a Jew 
which is the tasks of Yisrael. And since Yaakov is Yisrael, he is the image of man. So therefore, we see that the Merkava is literally the metaphor that says everything about the structure of the Bria. It says how God gets into the Bria, which automatically tells us what is the purpose of man to bring God to the Bria, right? And it tells us that there is God is concealed from the universe, or else God wouldn't have to get to the Bria. So it tells us the state of the universe, which is an absence of the presence of God. It tells us the purpose of man, or Yaakov, or Yisrael, to bring God into the Bria, right? It tells us how, by the two tikkunim, you have to occupy yourself with removing the eight Sahara and then spreading holiness, right? It tells us that Yisrael is the one who does that, and who's the one? It's Yaakov. And it tells us the way you do it is by adopting the will of the driver, right? That's the way a chariot works. Now you see why the chariot is such a fundamental idea in the vision of Yechezkel. Why Yisrael and Mekava? Because what he was looking at was a metaphor that represents the entire structure the fundamental structure of the of, of the whole Bria. This is the idea of of of, uh, of the Merkava. And why was it said? Why was it said after the Bris? Because that was the agreement. What was the agreement that the Rebbeinu Shlom made with Avram? What was the agreement that he made with him? He said that you are the one who's going to do those two tikkunim. You are the ones who are going to bring God's presence and remove both kinds of hesters. The Hester contributed by man, and the Hester contributed by God. You are the one. So if you're the one, then what are you? You are a chariot. You know, it's, it, it says, Avram, God designated Avram to be a chariot after the bris, because that's exactly what the covenant was, the agreement. You are going to be the chariot. What is the chariot? The individual who will take God and bring him into the Bria. That's exactly what the chariot is. That's why at that point in time, the Rabbi Shem told them, you are the chariot. You have now become the Merkava to the, for, for the entire Bria. You and, of course, all your descendants after you. Therefore, what we see so far is that the idea of Merkava coming after the Bris is really a metaphoric statement of the entire agreement. And that's why Itaka comes after, that's why Itaka comes after the idea of the Bris. So therefore we see that the, the Rabbi Shalom essentially made a new agreement with Avram that from now on he and his descendants would be the ones who are going to bring the Tikkun, which means they are going to bring the Rabbi Shalom back into the Bria and no one else. It is important to note that in the Pusik where it says that Avram became a Merkava, the name that the Rabbi Shalom uses to describe himself is Elohim, which is the Rabbi Shalom in his role as a judge. This means that Avram Avinu, he merited to become a Merkava by schus, because of merit. He earned it as a result of his avoidus. It was not given to him freely. That's why the appellation is Elohim, the Midis Hadin, the Rabbanu Shalom, in his attribute as a judge. Avram earned it. Therefore, he and his descendants now become the true Mesaknin of the entire Bria.